the uh, central topic that um, is really this question. Um, can a monetary union, where you have um, several countries, several governments, sharing one currency, can that work without movement towards, I hate this very progress towards, um, movement towards physical union, meaning one government, uh, one parliament, one set of laws, and so on. Um, and um, this was always the core question with this experiment. Uh, Euroglass called it the European construction. Um, this was always the key issue. Um, many Eurosceptics said that it couldn't work without physical union. So did many enthusiasts for the project, including such people as President Mitterrand and Chancellor Cole. And they saw monetary union as something that would um, act uh, to, 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 make, to bring in physical union. Incentive that every European government is straightforward, cheat on the public finances, maximize the deficit, and to hell the inflation rate. Answer, there has to be a single federal government, there has to be a centralized treasury, and so on, and then monetary union has to to political union. So Britain had a public debt that was twice its GDP, twice its national output, um, in 1815 after the Napoleonic Wars, um, in 1918 uh, after the First World War, and in 1945 after the Second World War. Um, but in all cases, the interest rate was around about 3%, so the interest payments on the debt were about 6% of GDP, that's quite a lot of money, but actually people were prepared to pay the taxes to pay the interest on the debt, about 6% of GDP. In the case of Greece, um, the, by the way, public spending as a whole is much lower, so I'm happy to pay the 6% of GDP and the interest on the national debt. The debt has risen, public debt has risen to about um, rising all through the last 10 or 15 years, risen to about 120% of GDP. Now, until the last few months, they've been cheating. Uh, they weren't disclosing that it was 120%, but they were saying it was, it was more like 8, 90%. And the interest rate on Greek government debt was a bit higher than that in German government debt, but not much. So you had a debt that was supposed to be 100% GDP, and the interest payments, say, were about 4, 4.5%. Four so the interest payments were about 4, 4.5% of GDP. <coughs> so people paying taxes to pay the bondholders, so on. 4% GDP, it's all right. But the truth was that the debt was 120% of GDP, and they had a huge bunch of deficit. The deficit was, in fact, about 12% GDP when they said it was about 6. So this thing was 120%, moving up to 140, 150%. What do you do if you're holding Greek government debt? You sell it. The price goes down, the yield rises. And this is the story of the yield on 10 year Greek government debt um, in the last um, six to nine months. You see, we started off about 4.5%. And um, these monthly averages, um, it was 9% in May. It's actually one or two days go up to over 12%. So imagine your tra trajectory where the, the public debt is going to be 150% of GDP and the interest rate is 12%. So the interest payments on the debt are 18% of GDP. In other words, you, the Greek taxpayer, are required to pay taxes equal to a fifth of all the revenue you produce in order to service the national debt. Come on. You've got to pay all the pensioners, you know, got everything else, that, all the farm subsidies, all everything else the free government does. And this debt interest burden rising making completely unsustainable. <laughs> the European Central Bank can't keep on buying government securities of um, the Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, it can't keep on making loans to the banking systems of these countries. When it says no, 
these countries have got an un unenviable set of choices, but really um, they, they are in effect being expelled from this union. Because I don't see, since the crisis is finite, this wonderful thing that the American Congress called Herb Stein said, um, the process um, is unsustainable, it will stop, and this will stop. And I think we're talking about the next three to six months. The other possible way this thing breaks up is actually with Germany, because the, the Maastricht Treaty has been breached, um, I doubt there is no case going to the German Constitutional Court. I will be very surprised if the German Constitutional Court um, just gives in in the way that Merkel did, and that also is, is, is another uh, uh, mechanism by which the Europe and Eurozone might break up. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I can assure you that um, 12 years from now, I will again be telling you my topic, so I'm not quite sure on what the topic, but thank you very much. Gentlemen, I apologise for being late. Um, I was supposed to the House of Commons on um, whether or not we should have what they call the e European External Action Service, a, a European uh, diplomatic corps. Um, I was one of a handful of people in the House who voted against us having a European External Service. <laughs> and we think there's been a change of government. <laughs> it seems to me that the arguments for coming out from an economic point of view get stronger by the day. But I think there's a political reason why we need to come out as well. I've noticed in the short time that I've been a member of parliament, there are huge areas of public policy in this country where people like me, those who vote for, those who send to the House of Commons, <coughs> frankly have no say at all. It seems that the nooks and crannies of micromanagement from Brussels hasn't just stagnated and stifled our economy, it's stagnated and stifled our democracy. In fact, most public policy is now made for us by our elected officials in Brussels. Most law is now made and also for us by our elected officials in Brussels. And I can't help thinking that one of the reasons why people are going to despise our Westminster system, going to despise our MPs, is because MPs have become literally parasitical. Okay. They cost a great deal in terms of subsidies for duck houses. <laughs> it's not very good at actually deciding the things that matter. And one of the reasons why I suspect people increasingly don't vote, why those who turn out seems to be uh, falling, one of the reasons why there is a growing contempt for the political process, one of the reasons why I'm also part of the also I hate people saying all you politicians are the same, is not because we really are all the same, but because in terms of what we can actually do, in terms of policy we can actually decide, more and more power has been ceded to unelected officials in the primary state the apex of which sits the European Commission in Brussels. I think we need to renew our democracy as much and as desperately as we should re re reinvigorate our economy. And I simply don't think that we can do that while we remain members of the European Union. What we're asking for is not radical. What we're asking for is liberal and democratic and mainstream around the world. One of the reasons, however, why it's portrayed as being extreme is because we face a number of very powerful vested interests in this country for whom EU membership is, is, is suitable. And I want to talk a bit about that. The first and the most powerful vested interest who wants us to remain in the European Union are big corporations and big business. Now, sometimes on the centre right, we've made the fatal mistake of believing that being pro business is the same as being pro free market. It isn't. And I don't think we should be afraid to speak out against big corporate interests. It's not the preserve of the left to be anti-big corporate interests. There are big corporate interests who rather like the EU. It allows them to direct barriers to entry in their markets. It allows them to rig the markets to their advantage. It allows them to engage in public procurement contracts that exclude the more nimble competitor. Big business is often pro the EU, not because they love the free market, so they will talk a lot about the single market. But precisely because the single market is not a free market, it's a rigged corporatist market. The second group of vested interests who like our EU membership are the politicians. Yeah. Not all of them, but many of them. If you have to do something that's a bit unpopular, it's quite nice to be able to go back to your constituent elements in the Commons or your constituency 
and blame someone else. Again and again, the policies that the people would not wear if they had to make the choice themselves are imposed and foisted upon the people because we're told it is a prerequisite by the membership. We're told that the Council of Ministers has agreed. We're told that it is in our interests because Europe says so. Mm. I, I wonder if there is a conspiracy of interest between politicians to blame the EU mm. for doing things that they dare not do for themselves and in their own name. Some people will talk about different types of tactics, how we could renegotiate our membership of the EU. Personally, I'm campaigning for an in-out referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Anything less than an in-out referendum, I believe, opens up the possibility that vested interests can ultimately discover um, our, our, our voice, and, and, and I'm amazed at how often it is that good Eurosceptics often seem to think that they can settle for something less than the restoration of our national sovereignty. Yes, we need good relations with Europe. Those are best obtained by being outside the EU. Thank you.